Alright, first movie in the Star Wars series. This is the place to start, right? Episode 1? Hope this spurs years of love for this saga. Sound design is on point. Feels pretty Star Warsy to me. I have a bad feeling about this. No feelings were harmed in the filming of this scene. It's not about the mission master, it's something elsewhere. Down center on your anxieties, Obi-Wan. All we've ever really seen of the master Padawan relationship was Yoda and Luke and a little Obi-Wan and Luke, but nothing ever like this. Going back in history obviously affords lots of opportunities like this to see things we only ever heard anyone talk about in the original trilogy, and that's pretty great. But Master Yoda said I should be mindful of the future. But not at the expense of the moment. Be mindful of the living force, young Padawan. We're also introduced to our two main characters, though The Phantom Menace is mostly Qui-Gon's film. It's a quick glance at the experienced master that has learned to push the letter of the Jedi law to do what he thinks is right, compassionate, and moral. While Obi-Wan is a little bit of a stickler as a Padawan still learning how the world and the Force works. Arrogantly quoting Yoda, but then knowing when he's been put in his place by his wiser master. Yes, master. The blockade is finished. We dare not go against the Jedi. We've also never experienced a culture that recognizes that the Jedi should be feared as they're one of the most powerful forces in the universe. Is that legal? I will make it legal. With all the different plot threads to keep track of, I really appreciated that they're pretty upfront about who Darth Sidious actually is. Also, they got the original actor Ian McDermott to reprise his role as a younger emperor. Was it just dumb luck that they cast him at 40 to play a 100-year-old looking Sith and Jedi? Anyway, he's as amazing now as he was then. And the Emperor-to-be is one of the most formidable villains ever created, having his hands in almost everything. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's watch that again. I thought everything in these prequels was CGI. That's a practical explosion if I've ever seen one. Miniature still, but practical. And now we get to see the Jedi prove their power and speed like never before, only six minutes in. All right, maybe this movie isn't all boring trade disputes. And it's sort of a switch on the typical trope that our heroes are actually the invincible, unstoppable force against the bumbling droids. Let's split up. Stow aboard separate ships and meet down on the planet. I'm gonna try to avoid referencing or arguing with Red Letter Media's Phantom Menace review because it's really long and it was mostly done for comedy. And as much as I love it as entertainment, a lot of it is deliberately ignorant for comedy's sake. But every once in a while, a clip from it pops into my head. I remember him being really upset that they went on separate ships, but that's actually a smart move. It splits the odds of both of them getting caught in half, or doubles the odds of one of them having success. I feel like this makes me racist, but I cannot tell the difference between Kira Knightley and Natalie Portman when they're in the Queen makeup. Maybe I have that face blindness disorder. Anyway, that was the point, and fun fact, Kira Knightley is a household name thanks mostly, not entirely, but mostly due to looking like Natalie Portman. How could that be true? Again, no huge secret, but I love that little distortion in the hologram that gives the Emperor his signature raspy growl. So isn't this movie supposed to be slow and boring? Ten minutes in and the main conflict has basically began. The Federation is sending their army down to Naboo, revealing their true intentions. And then there was Jar Jar. I'm not convinced Qui-Gon was actually trying to save him rather than just falling down and saving himself. Still, saving your the guy who everyone will point to as the biggest issue with the prequels, even though he was supposed to just be comic relief. Of all the complaints levied, no one can complain about some of the new worlds this movie introduces. The underwater city is magnificent and wasn't anything anyone was expecting. And the design inside the city is unique and interesting. Water force field! How rude! So who's watching the Full House reboot on Netflix, eh? Eh? Just me and my wife then. We could use a transport. Jedi mind tricks are used throughout the franchise, but Qui-Gon is one who continually uses them when the ethical implications are a bit murky. But that's just strong character development. He's more about the spirit of right and wrong. He's willing to push the line for the greater good, which in this case is warning the Naboo of an impending invasion. You and the Naboo form a symbiont circle. What happens to one of you will affect the other. You must understand this. And if you think Obi-Wan is doing the same thing, this happens later. Begin searching the swamps for these rumored underwater villages. So he was telling the truth. I saved his life. He owes me what you call a life debt. And we also get one more of Qui-Gon's most important traits. Compassion. Compassion that Obi-Wan lacks at this stage in his life. Sure, Qui-Gon passes it off as Miss Gungan may be of help. But he saw a life in peril and decided to intervene. It's also Anakin shadowing. Is that a giant shrimp? Remember that thing I said about whales? Yeah, heebie jeebies apply. In fact, that thing is much, much, much worse. <laughs> More Super Jedi skills and rescuing the princess. <laughs> Look at this guy's mustache and goatee. Sure, I'm a diplomat, but that doesn't mean I can't have a party on my face. Uh, that doesn't compute. Oh, wait, uh, you're under arrest. Come on, you laughed the first time you saw that. Ain't no AI here. Ah, uh, the red shirt droids. Someone's gotta do it. That little droid did it! R2-D2 to the rescue! Yeah, Master. Tatooine. 
It's small, out of the way, poor. Ewan McGregor's voice is so silky. And he brings me to something a lot of people seem to forget about the original trilogy. Coincidences, or in Star Wars, the Force constantly puts people places and brings characters together in ways that seem ridiculous. But it's a large part of the mythos. Consider that Leia put a message in a droid that was found by her long lost twin brother on a random desert planet. Just saying. This is my apprentice, Darth Maul. Yep, that is all. I've always loved this mirror shine Naboo cruiser. What can I say? It calms me. Moisture farms. Just like Uncle Owen. Again, I'm seeing people in costume, not CGI dinosaurs blocking the frame. Were we lied to? Or is it just environmental establishing shots? Are you an angel? And the sparks of love are sparked. An or angel. lit. I, heard I don't know, Anakin fell in love at first sight. They're the most beautiful creatures in the universe. Also compliments. I don't fully understand. This is a strange place to me. I know, Padme. Which brings us to another point. Star Wars has always been about exploring new worlds and seeking out new life. Wait. Uh, Mad Max called, it wants its filthy character back. Wait, is that Maz Kanata? R2-D2, a pleasure to meet you. I am C-3PO. See, this is the right amount of ridiculous for Star Wars. C-3PO and R2-D2 meeting with a little classic banter. My parts are showing. My goodness. Oh. <laughs> Say what you will about the overuse of CGI environments. Coruscant from space and then in the atmosphere is really astonishing. You've gotta love seeing the detailed cities from above like this. You must have Jedi reflexes if you race parts. Never noticed that instantaneous Jedi reflexes demonstration. I actually saved the pod, mostly. Optimism. Watto may be a glaring example of CGI at the top of its 1999 game, but he's at least a new type of character. Small flying with a gonzo nose. Dude, is that Greedo? I find that Jar Jar creature to be a little odd. And coming from 3PO, that's saying something. Even Master Yoda doesn't have a midi-chlorian count that high. Oh, the midi-chlorians. Even I disparaged them in my episode 7 video. But it's just an easy way of communicating that Anakin has some Force strength. And it's been established that Force power is genetic since the Force is strong in the Skywalker family. So what's the difference, really? Hey, Twi'lek slave girls aren't getting eaten by a Rancor in this scene. The best part of the negotiations is that Watto claims, Mind tricks gonna work on me! Yet Qui-Gon has been playing him almost from the beginning without Jedi mind tricks using basic negotiating skills. Like asking for more than you actually want and convincing the other party that they're getting the better deal. They will never get me onto one of those dreadful starships. Seems legit. What is going on here? This is another miniature set, and a crazy detailed one as well. Who secretly put all this work into this film? Goldberg? And Greedo's dad? May the Force be with you. It comes up subtly a few times, but I do love to hear John Williams' classic Luke Force theme score a few times when talking about Annie. Jabba has some serious employee loyalty. Again, exactly the right amount of awesome we've come to expect from Star Wars sound design. And you have to really stick to your prequel hate to not enjoy the pod racing. Tense, exciting, some awesome first person cinematography, the effects are off the charts, and the pod race is Star Wars. You've got to at least admit that. Just a really well shot and directed sequence. We made, we made it to the, the movie! movie. Yay, <laughs> Ingenuity and working well under pressure. We're also getting to see a lot more of Luke's home planet, which is some behind the curtain kind of fun. <laughs> Got him. Hugging. And we get our first brief lightsaber duel, giving us a taste of what's to come. Over an hour in and just a quick showcase of Ray Park's abilities, which are extensive. Star Wars does villains right. I made this for you. Generosity. I know at some point we hit that saturation point of CGI that becomes mind-numbing. I'm just not sure when it happens. So far, it's been used to enhance and liven the world. Coruscant is one big city. So I'd say this is exactly the kind of traffic we should expect. And again, another amazing space view of the planet. Checking on your buddies. So you guys are, you're gonna, you're staying, okay. He is mired by baseless accusations. Hmm, I wonder who's been making those baseless accusations. The nuance of Palpatine's plan is layered. Hints throughout that he actually does more behind the scenes with influence than as a senator, securing his seat as Supreme Chancellor all while begrudgingly accepting the position. The Sith have been extinct for a millennium. I do not believe the Sith could have returned without us knowing. This should be clear. This is very important. The first few lines from the Jedi Council, supposedly the wisest group of people in the galaxy, have become so overconfident and bloated that they're insulted at the notion that they didn't see the return of the Sith instead of, you know, trying to figure out what they were doing wrong and how they missed it. I move for a vote of no confidence in Chancellor Valorum's leadership. Well, of course, the ETE planet is going to support that. Bunch of fascists. Do not defy the council master, not again. I shall do what I must, to be one. If you would just follow the code, you would be on the council. Exactly, exactly the reason Qui-Gon is not on the council, because he sees the problems. Also, how about that sunset? 
Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. That line has been challenged as nonsense, but it's exactly Anakin's path. Fear of losing his mother led to hate of the Tusken Raiders, led to them and him suffering, though mostly them. Obi-Wan is ready. I am ready to face the trials. This may have been Qui-Gon's one real misstep. Obi-Wan still has a lot to learn from Qui-Gon, and he doesn't really learn it until after he's dead. But Qui-Gon recognizes the importance of Anakin, so again he's willing to twist the truth a tad. They continually speak to us, telling us the will of the Force. Further solidifying that midi-chlorians are not the Force. And those two control the pitch. You catch on pretty quick. Short cockpit lesson and affirmation that he's a quick study validates Annie's ability to fly later. No Gary Stews here. <laughs> Hey Space fans, John Williams here. Remember when you thought that there was nothing left to add to the amazing Star Wars theme I already composed? Don't you feel silly now. And badass bad guy with a badass weapon. Say what you will about lack of emotion and flashover substance, the first real lightsaber duel in the prequel trilogy blew my mind. Beautiful choreography that's shown off with very little quick cutting the first double laser staff style lightsaber, and it expands the trend of lightsaber battles traveling to different locations throughout the fight like Empire and Jedi touched on a bit. Oh. And teamwork, with no communication, just an implied history of fighting together. And the other three battles all flow perfectly one to the next. The attack on the mothership is one of the prettiest battles we'd seen yet. The ground battle between natives and machines pit two very different adversaries against one another. And although the least compelling was probably Padme trying to get to the throne room, it had the shortest clips and moved the story along. One other nitpick from Plinkett is something I actually agreed with up until this viewing. He compares Luke and Vader's fight in Return of the Jedi with Obi-Wan and Maul's fight after Qui-Gon is killed. The issue being Luke loses it on Vader while Obi-Wan goes back to pretty choreographed fighting. Two things. First, Vader was all but done. He was wiped out, so it didn't take much skill for Luke to hammer him. Maul, on the other hand, has been resting, waiting for Obi-Wan to come through the force field, taunting him. Had this been an R-rated movie, he probably would have mutilated Qui-Gon's corpse to further enrage Obi-Wan so that Obi-Wan would lose it. Because you know what happens to people who fight angry against skilled fighters in control of their emotions? They lose. Number two is that the entire point of that scene in Jedi was Luke slipping to the dark side. He was a fairly new, albeit powerful Jedi who had had very little training. Thank goodness Obi-Wan had training to fall back on to stay calm and fight, or he would be dead. While it totally doesn't take away from the final battle in The Force Awakens, I believe there is still a place for this type of fighting. This was a time when Jedi were prevalent, constantly using their sabers. So the Sith would obviously need to train to compete, and what looks choreographed to us is really just the Jedi and Sith predicting each other's moves using the Force. These are warriors at the top of their game. Another practical explosion? Who does Lucas think he is, not just using CGI? I'm sure you're gonna harp on this, but this is my one complaint. I know he comes back in some non-canon stuff, but we got so little of Darth Maul and he kind of went out like a moron. Still glad Obi-Wan got to avenge Qui-Gon, though. Nevertheless, grave danger I fear in his training. Loving that little Vader musical cue in the background. Peace! Peace. True confession time. The year was 1999. I was 14 years old and everyone around me was losing their minds over something called Star Wars. I knew it existed, and I knew the Empire Twist because I had seen Tommy Boy. My sister-in-law let me borrow her VHS trilogy, and my life was never the same. Typical story. I've forgiven my parents for keeping the Wars Among the Stars away from me for 14 years, and taking me to see the movie in theaters made up for it. Where did I go with my grandmother? I, I mean, I mean, my, my, my friends, all my, all my friends and my, my <laughs> girlfriend. Anyway, the point of that embarrassing anecdote is that it brings me to my first Star Wars theater experience. I never read any reviews, and movie flopping at the box office because of viral Twitter hate didn't really exist yet. It wasn't until much later that I learned that I was not allowed to like The Phantom Menace. Because I freaking loved it, and diving into it like this only made me love it more. Now, I understand the problems. Although if you're staking your hatred for the prequels on the red letter media critiques, please understand that those are as much for entertainment value as they are scathing. The hardest thing to argue with is the plot being a little convoluted and maybe trade tax isn't the best impetus for your Star Wars fantasy story? The Phantom Menace wasn't sure what it wanted to be, and maybe the political mumbo jumbo could have been trimmed back. Something else that comes up is whether taxing trade routes is really enough to go to war over. Number one, if you have to ask, you weren't paying attention to US history. And whether or not the blockade was currently affecting Naboo, you can imagine it would rile some people up and frighten even more. Number two, it was all an illusion set up by Palpatine. So number one is moot, but it's still actually all fleshed out. The Trade Federation was getting taxed on their trade routes, so they set up a blockade as protest. But all you need to know is this, greedy evil businessmen picking on little guy. But none of that even matters to me. My rule is and always has been, did it entertain me? And the answer is yes. It's always been yes. Every couple years I watch the entire saga and I don't skip any of the prequels. Ultimately, the choice of story thread for the prequels was a bold move on Lucas's part. The original trilogy is about a seeming nobody's rise through the ranks of a rebellion as a true underdog. 
while the prequel trilogy is about the fall of democracy, rise of an empire, and creation of an anti-hero. It's easy to relate to Luke. It's easy to empathize with the last remaining Jedi and the rebels trying to overthrow pure evil. It's harder to connect with a blind council of wise men that can't see the writing on the wall and allowed themselves to be corrupted from within. As much as Yoda was an exception, he also missed it. As I already said, Qui-Gon is our main character in Phantom Menace. Should it have been Obi-Wan? Maybe. I feel I need to point out that Qui-Gon is about as Jedi as you can be. Long, flowing locks, constant stoic look on his face. Everyone always talks about Ewan McGregor, and don't get me wrong, he's great. But Liam Neeson is fantastic as a Jedi. Qui-Gon is one of the last Jedi to really understand the Force and refuses to join the Council because he sees the problems in complacency. In a sense, Qui-Gon is everything the Jedi Council should be, and Obi-Wan is everything that is wrong with them. In this film, Obi-Wan grows a bit, unfortunately it's only enough to take Annie on as a Padawan when he still ultimately disagrees with his master. And going forward, I'll be talking about the many ways that Obi-Wan did fail Anakin, where Qui-Gon may have not. Had someone other than Palpatine allowed Annie to indulge his urges, I'm getting ahead of myself, and there are two more films. It's hard to not talk about the entire trilogy when defending the prequels, because they actually tell a coherent story and each protagonist is given an arc. Whether you like them or not, or whether they entertain you, is up to each of you. One other thing I wanted to touch on was the theory that Jar Jar was actually Lucas's choice for the Sith Master. There is quite a bit of evidence for it, but Lucas is yet to confirm it. He mouths people's lines occasionally as if he's controlling them. The Queen wishes it. Waves his hands around when good things are happening to him, as Jedi do when they're mind-tricking people. The most compelling is that he seems to actually manipulate Padme into making a treaty with the Gungans. It's a fun theory, and if it's true, I'm sad that the world shamed Lucas into cutting Jar Jar back. It's astonishing to me how easy it is for people to jump on George Lucas for ruining Star Wars. Star Wars. His creation. Without Lucas, we wouldn't have Star Wars. Is that lost on us? We don't own Star Wars. Well, neither does he anymore, but that's because we all told him he sucked. The man created Star Wars. Just for a second, put yourself in his shoes and try to remember that he's a human being and try to understand the pressure of following up the cultural phenomenon you created 16 years later. And you know what? Since he created it, if he wanted the Phantom Menace to be stick figures fighting with blue blobs with racist poetry flashing on a screen or just two hours of different angles of his face, he has that right. I don't know. The hate this film gets is undeserved. Let's see how next week goes. When I do Red Tails! Sigh! Jabba Duha!